Um, and the foundation for the roundhouse is still out there in the weeds, but all of this is looking very sad nowadays. Um, this is the south end, this is Tiburon. Um, you can see sort of the transition from the steam era to the diesel era, and the reason why I uh, decided to uh, include this one is because that's the number 112. It's the only remaining Northwestern Pacific uh, steam locomotive, and she is in the care of the California State Railroad Museum right now. Um, and I love that it's also a color picture. You can see the, the Black Widow steam, and then you can see the green of the steam locomotive. So um, this is actually Arcata. This is a little time lapse that I put together because I found the first picture and I said, huh, that kind of looks like that second picture. And I realized it's all Alliance. Uh, this is Alliance Boulevard in, um, in Arcata and this is it in 2012. And you can see that the tracks are totally paved over. And that's the number 112. So we know that the locomotive that now lives in Sacramento at one point did some work in Arcata, which is kind of cool. In 1941, we were definitely ramping up the use of the railroad because of this little thing called World War II. So, um, in 1907, uh, this is full background of the NWP, um, we have the consol consolidation. Uh, so in 1903, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, uh, known as the ATSF, which was a mainline railroad, uh, created the San Francisco Northwestern uh, Railway. It ends up controlling the main line from Eureka to Shively. So that ends up being like the first iteration of what would later become NWP. Um, and this is, uh, this is sort of like where we see the initial right of way through uh, the canyon to Shively. Pacific Lumber Company built the section that we know as the Bluffs. Um, so in 1907, 45 different companies actually get consolidated and it becomes uh, the Northwestern Pacific Railroad Company. Now, I don't want to imply to you that there were 45 different railroads, but there were 45 different companies. Some companies became either some sort of corporation or some sort of holding where people <coughs> intended on building some sort of track, um, but they ended up all getting consolidated in 1907. So, it ends up taking them from 1907 all the way to 1914 to build from Shively to Willits, which that's a long time for such a short amount of trackage. Um, and ATSF, or Santa Fe, they knew, um, along with Southern Pacific, that there was not going to be enough room in the canyon for two railroads, so they decided to go in on it together. Which is why um, the two of them owned the railroad through the canyon until 1929. So all lumber and other products coming to or leaving Humboldt before 1914 had to cross the mouth of Humboldt Bay. And you might have seen recently, like in Las Coast Outpost, they're saying that the, uh, the bay is so silted in. Um, hasn't been the most uh, historically easy bay to get in and out of. So the railroad was a very welcome thing, especially when they were trying to rebuild San Francisco. So, um, why NWP? Well, of course, green gold. For the same reason that um, Europeans started settling California to come for the gold rush, they later found that Humboldt County did not have the gold that they thought it might. So they turned to the trees. Um, this is a, this is the North Fork, which later became um, Corbell. You can see 22 feet in diameter. Pretty amazing. Um, this is the Oregon and Eureka Railroad number 11. Um, this is a really famous picture because this is a this is actually out near Lufenholz, uh, which is kind of near Trinidad. And I've seen this wrongly um, actually annotated, but this locomotive is not an NWP locomotive. This is the one that was actually built in Samoa. Uh, this engine was actually built where the Timber Heritage Association that I work for, we now occupy the shops, and it was the biggest, biggest rod locomotive built north of Sacramento um, up to this point, and that was built in 1911, I believe. Um, here's Cornell. If any of you are familiar with the north end of McKinleyville, there's Highway 101. It's just two lanes. Um, this is actually uh, what is now Clam Beach. There was a full uh, overpass where the railroad went into Cornell. Um, and I have video of one of our locomotives that we own, uh, Big George, the Hammond number 15, actually steaming over that uh, trestle. Um, here is uh, the Scotia Bluffs. This is one of the most um, treacherous and difficult to maintain sections of the, uh, of the railroad. And this was built by Pacific Lumber Company. Um, all of these things are leading up to what would later become NWP. Um, and really, what the county needed was a way to ship goods and people. Um, and the profit would be bolstered by the ability to ship these products efficiently. 
Um, and in modern terms, um, from what I understand, one rail car can equal about three or so semi-truck loads, which says a lot about what a 100-car train um, pushing at Eureka would be hauling um, in the 1970s. So um, I want to talk for a minute just about how difficult this was. Um, so this is a newspaper clipping from the Humboldt Room, uh, $25 per foot to construct. <coughs> So there were a total of 40 tunnels. There's not even 40 tunnels now. They ended up daylighting a lot of them. Um, but there were 40 tunnels and over uh, 54 major bridges. And just for fun, when I was bored one day, I decided to try to count all the water crossings uh, through the Hill River Canyon. And I gave up because there's so many. There's so many little uh, streams that go through. Nowadays, most of the culverts are long gone. Um, this is just a little uh, clip about what it took to actually build Island Mountain. Consider that these people were using the technology that they were, these people were contemporary to the Titanic. This is 1912 when they're doing this. Um, so this quote, one shot hung fire, which happened sometimes, and didn't go off with the rest. The men all went back in to the tunnel and started working when it went off and killed 17 of them. So we hear a lot about how, um, how dangerous, say, like the transcontinental uh, summit tunnel was right near Donner Lake. Uh, we actually hiked it this summer. Um, you hear a lot about the number of people that were lost there, but we don't talk enough about the fact that there was a lot of sacrifice here building this. And most of these people were not well-off people. They were mostly immigrants, uh, people who came to get work, and a lot of times they were doing the most dangerous jobs like this. So, uh, 1914, seven years later, the line was finally completed at Cane Rock on October 23rd, 1914. Um, hundreds of people traveled by train uh, from Eureka and from San Francisco. I believe the mayor of San Francisco, the mayor of Eureka, they were both there. Um, and then, of course, all the railroad officials. Um, the county was now linked to the outside world. Um, that's my picture. That's the actual Golden Spike. Um, it's stored at Wells Fargo, I believe, in Eureka. And back in 2014, uh, Timber Heritage, along with the Clark, we had an event commemorating the 100-year anniversary. So I was very excited to find this <coughs> this bike. Um, and this is just a little plaque that we put up. Um, this is talking about just how much this took. Uh, the part I think is really interesting it says, uh, it would cost them $13 million. Um, and it also mentions that they, where is it? Right here, I'm talking about the amount of earth that has moved. Um, 10 million. 10 million, yeah. It, it was an absolutely um, 10 million cubic feet of earth and rock. Absolutely monumental. And the fact that most of these people were doing this kind of labor by hand, um, they started using steam shovels in the later days, so it was a little bit easier than the transcontinental of the 1860s, but not easy work. There weren't many labor unions back then. What did they do with all that? ground and rock did it just fall down into the river? Um, a lot of it, if they had to remove it from one section, they would use it for fill on another yeah. section. And yeah, eventually, don't worry, it all gets blasted away in 64 and 55. Mm -hmm. So um, this picture right here, I actually took this. This, uh, after we went to Island Mountain, we went to Cane Rock. Um, and it was actually my hope to get there in 2014, because I thought it'd be kind of cool to be there in October of 2014, 100 years later, but I'll settle for September 15. Um, so here you can actually see them. Um, that's Alice Palmer. I believe she was the daughter of one of the railroad employees, and she was actually holding the spike while they hammered it. And this is the exact spot um, 100 years later. Um, the tracks are washing out from underneath it. Um, there was an active spring coming out on the side of the hill there, and it just oozes. It's this blue goo. The golden spike, when they hammered it in, did it stay there? No. No, they took it back out. Of yeah, it was ceremonial. Back. I was going to say. Yeah. Okay. And they usually, they would do it into a polished eye of some really high-grade wood. Got it. Okay. Now you mentioned that, that spike you showed was the original spike. Okay. You said, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know what the actual actual story is. You probably had a old drill. Yeah, yeah. Very oh, yeah. gently. Yeah. So um, this is sort of a, a view of that same event from a different perspective. That's looking at the Cane Rock um, bridge, which is just south of Alder Point. 
So, some people, uh, this is something, there's so many jokes about the name NWP, Never Without Problems, Nowhere in Particular. Uh, also, an official slogan was Never Without Public Regard, but we don't talk about that one. Um, so, celebrations in Eureka and Arcadia were actually delayed immediately, which is a really eerie forecast for the next hundred years. Um, so, immediately after the ceremony, um, Sorry, I meant before the ceremony. Uh, there was a landslide at McCann, north of the event, and the, the train was actually delayed on its way to the ceremony, which is not the best thing. Yeah. Uh, not a good start, no. So it really was an eerie forecast for the next 85 years in McCann. Um, I always like showing this because I just think that the picture's great, but the text is amazing. We are now wedded to the universe by rails of steel. We welcome you to Humboldt County, California, through the Redwoods. That's, that's like deep. That's great. Yeah. And just think about the fact, many of you know this, but in 1914, 101 was not 101 as it is today. It was practically a dirt road. And because the automobile was not quite um, to the point where people could rely on it, especially not overland travel like this, you had ships. Uh, you had stagecoaches, and eventually you had the railroad. And being able to go from Willits to Eureka in oh, nine <laughs> hours, wow, that's amazing. That's light speed. Okay, so NWP was a vital artery. Uh, there were mills in Cornell, Arcata, Samoa, Eureka, Falk, Carlotta, Fortuna, Scotia, and on and on. And on. There's so many that I didn't even list it here. Uh, there was Dairy in Eureka, Lolita, and Fernbridge fish packing in Eureka, and passenger stations throughout the canyon and North End. Um, and it really was an empire. This is just, just briefly, just look at those dotted lines. That's all trackage that NWP at one point owned. It went all the way out to uh, Casadero, out near Bodego Bay. Um, there were narrow gauge lines. It really was an empire. We're going to go to the next one. Uh, this is 600 volt inner urban service. We like to think that it, this idea of mass transit is so novel and new, but we had it. And then we started all driving cars and we ripped it all out and now we're going, huh, there's too many cars. What should we do? Well, we had it and we lost it. There were branch lines also. The uh, Albion branch was literally just this section of the track. The dotted line, they never finished it. Um, but we also had the CWR, so it interchanged with the skunk. And that's one of the reasons why the skunk is kind of landlocked now, because all of this is closed. So they're not stuck. And then uh, the northern terminus, if you look way up there, you can see that it connected with Field Brook, uh, Little River Junction, and then all the way uh, to Trinidad. And they were serving to try to get all the way to um, uh, Oregon. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't Crescent City. I mean, it would have had to, had to go through Crescent City. But they were um, Grants Pass. They were trying to get Grants Pass. And they even had like a little bit of fanfare, and they're like, this isn't going to work. And they abandoned the idea. So um, we did have passenger rail. A lot of people think that uh, this was uh, 100 years ago, but it, it wasn't, actually. It officially ended in 1971. Um, mo like most mainline railroads, NWP had passenger service. The problem is, is that taking care of passengers and feeding them and being nice to them mm -hmm. is a lot harder to do than just hauling freight. So most railroads didn't like doing it. And later on, as it become less, became less profitable and the airline industry started to really take over, uh, Amtrak became a thing. And that was uh, May 1st, 1971. Um, and it was established by the Congressional Rail Passenger Service Act. And this also signaled the end of the beloved Bud Car, aka SP number 10, which I'll show you in a second. Um, this picture is so amazing for someone that recognizes the different things inside of it. You have the block signals. Um, you can see the bud car coming into the station. This would be going, uh, for us non-railroaders, that would be southbound. Um, you can actually see, this is a, uh, a work train in the background. Of course, you have the, uh, the burner right here. And then this guy right here, that's not actually a train order post. So as the, uh, the guys in the caboose would roll by, or the, uh, um, any other train crew, they would actually grab train orders off of that post. Mm -hmm. Uh, because in the early days we didn't have radios, they actually had to write the, uh, 
the destination for the train down and what kind of cargo you were carrying. Uh, this is the Scotia Bluffs, again, um, showing you just how massive these passenger trains were at one point. Um, I love this. This is Lolita. If you've ever been to a Timber Heritage event, you might have actually ridden these rails. We run the speeders on this trackage. Um, the depot was torn down. And that's the bug car on our beloved Island Mountain Bridge. Um, and really, NWP was the center of industry. Um, I had another picture of the balloon track up here, but I wanted to put up something that was a little bit more obscure and more amazing, honestly. <coughs> this is Arcata. Yeah. So this is actually just near the high school. Um, actually, no, sorry, not near the high school. This is near um, the Y, and if you look, that's actually the Creamery District right there. Now the Arcata Playhouse, and you can see, um, you see spurs going into the barrel company there. Um, some of this trackage is still there, but the most of it has been totally mothballed and removed. And are those all logs down there in the... Yeah. Those yep. are like log ponds? Logs, lumber, and then, yeah, that's a log pond there. Yeah, there are log ponds all over the place. Mm -hmm. What year was that picture taken? This is in, from the Schuster collection at HSU, so this would have to be between, I believe he was active, what, 47 to 56 or so? Exactly. Yeah. 